Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank You so much that You have promised to give us wisdom and strength should we ask, and we do. We ask for Your Spirit to enter this place now, to enter our hearts, to give us wisdom and understanding, to lead us closer to You as we dig into Your Word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I just have to reset things a little bit uh, you know, after my wife's been up here to get it where it's supposed to be. Okay. All right. I have three favors. What's number one? Okay. If you've got a phone, please turn it off. I'm doing the same thing here. And I've got to enter my password because it requires a password to even turn it off. And she's going off. Okay. And why do we do that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, some of you, it's simply because you don't want to be laughed at should you start ringing, right? But, but it's a distraction for us. When it buzzes or beeps or tweets or whatever it does, our mind and attention get pulled from Christ to our devices. I'm sure that the devil's got a hand in that. The fact that every app you download wants to remind you of something. Um, you got 100 apps and you get 100 notifications every hour. It's, it's, it's really kind of messy. So when we open the Word of God, it's just a good practice to say during that time, shut it off, no distractions, let, let the Holy Spirit speak to you, not the Twitter from your phone, okay? All right, favor number two is pray specifically, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth, because my words are nothing, his words are everything. This is really important because I am just an opinion unless I am bound up in the Word of God. And how will you know that I'm bound up in the Word of God? By the Word of God. You hold the Word of God, you test me by it. You test everyone by it. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. This is how we prove what is true or not. But if we're not in this, how will we know? And the third request is... <laughs> Think, engage your mind. Interestingly enough, we struggle today, our education system, with a lot of people that are, are, are unable to achieve. Do you know that for hundreds of years, the number one way to train children to read was to have them read the Bible? Interestingly enough, when this country was founded, the average American had only a third to fifth grade education. But if you compare their third to fifth grade education to today, they actually compare to a, an academy or a college level graduate. And that was because even though they hadn't gone through formal schooling, they knew their Bible. And the entrance of his words brings life and understanding. You actually become more educated by reading the Bible. Uh, what does that say to all those atheistic philosophers? <laughs> I wouldn't read their stuff, right? Okay, all right. Our topic tonight, Revelation's ultimate deliverance. You've got your Bibles, right? Hold them up. I believe this is the Word of God, amen? This is our textbook, and we're going to be studying about it tonight. The ultimate deliverance. Jesus is coming very soon. How do we know? What will it look like? We're going to talk about that tonight. But first, I want to talk about Harry Truman. How many of you know Harry Truman? The Harry Truman in the picture, or are you thinking the president? The Harry Truman in the picture, I believe this is him right here. He actually was uh, honor, honorably discharged from the army due to an accident on the, what is it called, the Tunisia? I don't remember exactly what, it, uh, what the name was. I'd have to go back and look at it. In 1938, I believe, um, you know, it would have been before that. I'll have, to do, I'll have to do the math and figure that out a little bit later. Anyways, when he got out, he actually um, came to work at the Mount St. Helens Lodge. Loved it so much that in uh, 1938, he actually um, bought half ownership in Mount St. Helens Lodge. And then um, in that same year, later that same year, bought it all out and ran it until 1980. All told, he ran the lodge for 52 years. 
Not all of that was he the pure owner, but he was still the, the one that ran it. And it was one of the most popular attractions because it was situated on Spirit Lake on the south side of Mount St. Helens. Everyone wanted to go there. Spirit Lake was a popular place to go. It was beautiful. And uh, he, was, he was quite a character. He was, uh, everyone knew him, especially if you grew up in the area. Everyone liked him. Everyone, you know, kind of paid attention to what was happening with him and and, and they liked him just a lot. And so they'd go to not to just see Spirit Lake or the Lodge, they'd go to talk with him as well. But he wasn't all there. He was a little bit crazy. And that finally came out the couple months before Mount St. Helens blew up. Before that time, everyone heard him talk about his cats. He had 16 cats. He Loved to talk about them, named them all, talked with them on a daily basis. And if you were there, you get to hear him have conversations with his cats. I mean, that's not too weird. I mean, because we, we all do that. But he would have conversations with the mountain, too. She was his best friend. And after his wife passed away, he kind of, you know, felt like the mountain was his wife. 1980. They began evacuations because the seismic activity was increasing. There was a bulge on the, on the, on the face of Mount St. Helens. They expected an imminent eruption, and he wouldn't go. Wasn't interested. He became an overnight celebrity. I mean, he started getting fan mail and marriage proposals and all kinds of stuff. He, everyone loved him and his stubbornness. He wasn't going to move. And, and he would say things like, the mountain, she loves me. She's not gonna. She's not gonna erupt on me. She's not gonna blow me up. If anything happens, it'll probably just land in Spirit Lake, and everything will be fine. No, the mountain and I are like this. We're really close, and you know, she hasn't told me that it's gonna happen. Just, it, it's like it's kept getting crazier and crazier, and unfortunately, his predictions weren't right. Mount Saint Helens blew up. And Spirit Lake, right about there somewhere. He was in the direct path. I mean, all of this is coming out and falling down. The the, the volcanic shed was right there below where he's at. They they have no idea. It's, you know, at best, it's 150 feet under rubble at this point in time. That's how much. If you haven't haven't seen much about Mount St. Helens, basically 80% 80 of the mountain disappeared. 80% 80% of it disappeared and shifted on top of where he's at. She, she loved him all right to death. You know, some people today ignore all the signs. And, and sometimes it's trivial. Sometimes it's the speed limit signs. And guess what? Blue light special, right? Right? If we ignore the signs, it doesn't, it, that doesn't mean we get to skip out on the consequences. And yet some people would think that it's okay to do that. Can we stop the inevitable? Is it possible to stop progress? Can you put a cracked egg back together? Will a Band-Aid fix it? No. And if a woman's giving birth, can you tell her to just stop? Wait, no, undo all of it. <laughs> We can't stop what is in motion. We don't have that ability. Just as much as he could stop that eruption, we cannot stop what's happening around us. That means if we as Christians today are going to be different, we've got to take note of what's going around us and actually apply ourselves. These days, it's really popular to be Christian. In fact, there's more churches than there have ever been. There's more people attending churches than they've ever been. More people claiming that they're Christians than they've ever been, and it's more popular to be a Christian. I mean, when it comes to political election season, I mean, every political candidate is a Christian. You, you might not have ever seen them in church. They haven't probably been in church in a long time, but they're Christian just to get the vote. And then you don't ever see them in church again either. But they're Christian. But it's not just in politics. We as, as a society are fascinated with end time events. Time Magazine, the Bible and the apocalypse, why more Americans are reading and talking about the end of the world. Are they really talking about the end of the world? 
Are they? I mean, to be fair, when was the last time you heard someone talk about, you know, the fact that Jesus is coming soon and the end of the world? Well, that, that's a, a trick question because most people don't talk about it in the biblical sense, but they always talk about end time events because they're talking about the stock market crashing and the hurricanes coming and the climate and global change and all that kind of stuff. And they're, they're talking about the latest movies, which are all about end time events and aliens coming, all that kind of stuff. It's not a coincidence. No. So they, they are talking about apocalypse and end time events, but the devil's got him barking up the wrong tree. On top of that, we read in the Bible that there are signs in the world of politics. It's not just about talking about the world. It's not just talking about the end of the world. We see it. Governments are collapsing. Wars and rumors of wars. It's not getting better. It's no accident that our Congress can't hardly agree on anything. 150 years ago, they'd always work it out. These days, they always tantrum. They can't work anything out. They filibuster this, they filibuster that. There are signs in the world of nature. Hello? Things are not what they used to be. The world is crazy when it comes to weather. And society? Any of you remember back uh, 50 years ago and wish that it was kind of like that still? I mean, the world today? I mean, back then you could have a dozen kids. It wasn't a problem. These days, I mean, you can't hardly keep track of one. And you're afraid to manage one because of the troubles and trials. When I grew up, you could play in the street. You wouldn't want to do that now because back then people were considerate. Signs in religion. Wow, this is a mess. There are more religious channels on television and more fakes with it too. More scandals in religion and more fake religion. I, I don't even want to go into that list. That's a messy list. Here's the thing. We can see it without even having to read our Bibles that the world is no better than it was before it's getting worse. A logical person can see that. But let's take a look at what the Bible has to say Jesus was actually talking with his disciples and lined it out for us in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. He gave us clear and distinct signs to know the time of the end. The gospel of Matthew chapter 24. If you, if you have a bookmark, you will want to place it there tonight because we will be staying here in Matthew chapter 24 most of the night. Well, there'll be a couple of times we'll go to other chapters, but we'll be coming back here. Matthew chapter 24, first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. All right, good to see those pages turning. All right, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. And it says, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, they're, they're asking questions. What, what are these things? He, he's just been talking to them. Go back to verse 1. It says, and Jesus went out and just departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Stop for just a moment. Herod had put so much work into it. The white marble and the gold, I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous to look at, especially at sunset. It was amazing. They came out to show Jesus. Verse 2, Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So when the disciples are asking what things, you know, and you know, the signs of his coming and the end of the world, they're thinking that the destruction of Jerusalem is going to be the end of the world. Jesus was gracious, gracious enough not to just, you know, um, correct their error. The destruction of Jerusalem already happened. It happened in AD 70. It wasn't, it wasn't very far away from when he was talking then. 
the end of the world a lot farther away. So he didn't, he didn't correct their error, but he did answer their question. He gave them complete descriptions of what we would experience at the end of the world. Start in verse 6 with me. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax, what? Cold. Boy, that sounds like the modern news, doesn't it? That's a lot of details. Let's go over those just a little bit there. It's talking about war. Is there a little bit of war today? We went through the statistics. There's more war now than there's ever been in the history of the world. An average of 67 wars going on every day. Some are ending, some are beginning, some have been going on for years, and they'll continue to go on. The longest war right now, can you guess what country it is? It's Afghanistan. Right now, we have been in Afghanistan longer than any other. I don't think it's ever going to end, ever, right? It just seems like it keeps going on forever and ever. Jesus predicted just before the end, there would be international conflicts on a global scene. Wars and rumors of wars. I think there's more rumors than wars, but it's a lot. I mean, the 20th century, 180 million deaths from war alone, only surpassed by one other event. Can you tell me another time in history that exceeded 180 million deaths? Nope, that's it. That's included in the 180 million. This is talking about the 20th century. So and from 1900 to 2000, the 20th century, 180 million deaths. Outside of that time frame, can you tell me another time when more people died? Only one other time. Nope, that's all in that time frame. That was all in this time frame. That's all, that was, oh, that, no, 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 that was 2001. But not 180 million people died since then. The Dark Ages, I heard someone say it. The dark, in the Dark Ages, the number one killer was religion. More people died because of religious infighting and because of, of, of being condemned as heretics. And the majority of those were Christians in the Dark Ages. They estimate over 205 million people died in the Dark Ages because of religious persecution. We ha- we, now, obviously, that was over a longer period of time. That was over hundreds of years, and this is only 100 years. So this still stands as the marker, as the fulfillment of, of, Re- of, of prophecy. We have more wars and rumors of wars now than ever before. It's not getting better. It's not getting better. You mentioned it, 9-11. Can you remember where you were on that day? That is a marker. If you can remember where you were on the day, that is a marker of a tragedy. It's a big enough event that you know where you were on that day and what. And we all stood in disbelief. We couldn't believe it, right? Never thought, yeah. I mean, you, you, I mean, Pearl Harbor. This was a Pearl Harbor experience. We never thought it would happen, and it did. Diffusing the nuclear threat. <laughs> that, was, that was a while ago, and guess what? Has it worked? Iran, yeah, Iran has got blown that. I mean, they, they've got it already. And, and North Korea, it, yeah, no, it, it isn't working. Someone, someone's refusing, not defusing, right? And the war on terror. Interestingly enough, we are at a place in time where no longer are we at war with a country or a people We are at war with an idea. This is the scariest part because all that you have to do is be labeled by someone a terrorist and suddenly the world is at war with you. This is scary. It's not going to take much for groups of people to be put under that terror list who never were at war. 
That's why Russia's kicking out Christians, putting them on the terror index. Unless you're an Orthodox Christian, you are persona non grata in Russia right now. You are not openly allowed to testify to your faith or to read the Bible or to publicly study it with anyone else. Unless you are an Orthodox Christian, and then it doesn't matter because Orthodox Christians don't generally do any of those. They don't do evangelism. They don't read their Bibles. They just go to their services. Orthodox Christians are kind of like Catholics, just the Eastern Bloc, um, and, and they, don't, they don't need to because they just listen to whatever their priest tells them. Talked about famines. Do we still have those today? Yes, we do. Famine is very rampant in our world today. In fact, the United Nations says that 38 countries are registering as having a food shortage. That's one-sixth of the world as being undernourished. And I know we like to imagine that that's like some country somewhere else. But to be fair, I worked for a year in eastern Kentucky, eastern Tennessee. There are still places there where they have dirt floors and no electricity and no running water. We kind of think that's a little backwards. We usually think of Africa, Brazil, or, you know, China or something like that. But in the United States, and the crazy thing about it is, big house right here, a hauler with a whole bunch of people that don't even have running water. That big house has 11 car open garage with exotic cars in each stall and climate conditioned horse stalls. And right next door to them, they have people that are fighting for food every day. I used to go door to door selling books, Christian books, and it would aggravate me to no end when I would go to that door where those rich people were and they'd tell me they have no money. Well, I mean, it's partially true. It's all in the horse and in the car. They don't have anything left in the house, in the stable, in the property. They don't have anything left. They don't, and they don't care about it. And you can tell that really bugs me. Okay. 10,000 people die a day, 3.5 plus, 3 plus million because of starvation alone. Uh, do you recognize that uh, critter on there? That's the Michigan State bird. <laughs> At least I think the common folks among us recognize that. But um, Usually when we think of, of the Bible's terminology for pestilence, we think of pests something we'd call terminix or some pest control for. But in reality, the definition in the Bible is a pestilence is a strange disease which afflicts human beings, crops, and the environment. So it's not just a pest to us externally. It could be a pest internally. It could be a pest to around you. Um, another form of those pests, pestilences, are the new diseases springing up around the world. Can you think of a few? Come on. Huh? Bird flu? Huh? Mad cow? N N West Nile, right? Yeah? Yeah? I've got a couple of them here. Marbug virus, too, and Lyme's disease is actually increasing. Um, this is one they're saying is actually going to probably eclipse all the others because of the way clim climate change is affecting us. We no longer have the... I mean, okay, so whether or not you believe it or not, think about it this way. We don't have the snow that we used to have when we were kids. Just think of it that way. Winters are not hard anymore. You don't need to move south to Florida anymore because you only have a month of winter here in Michigan. The rest of the time, it's not hardly any snow on the ground, hardly any freezing. It's warm. That means the ticks aren't dying off. Neither are mosquitoes. On top of that, the bats that usually kill them are getting sick because they, they can't hibernate during that time because they're too hot. We're going to see an increase in the diseases that come along. And air pollution. That looks like something you want to breathe, right? You can hardly even see the buildings for the sake of the smog. 2.4 billion pounds of toxic pollutants cause an estimated 50,000 to 120,000 premature deaths each year. And earthquakes. We talked about earthquakes in diverse places, right? Let's talk about around home. 35 average earthquakes a day in the United States, 12 to 14,000 a year. And earthquakes don't play nice, do they? They destroy everything in their path, increasing on a daily basis. And the Scriptures tell us that. 
interesting, take a look at these numbers. In 2000, roughly 2,300 earthquakes. In 2010, 8,500. Increasing. Now notice something different. In 2011 and 2012, there's less. You know why? Because it shifted. Earthquakes are the movement of the tectonic plates. When, it has, when earthquakes happen in one side, it alleviates the stress in the other side, allowing it to slip on the other side. And so you actually see that in 1992, there was an earthquake here. And then in 1992, there was an earthquake here. And then in 93, there was an earthquake here. And then 93, let's see, 93 and 94. And then we got 95 and 98, 96. I mean, I mean it just it, it, it flops back and forth. And so when there are major earthquakes on one side of the rim, then the tectonic plates shift and alleviate stress on the other side. And then, of course, when you attach all those together, generally one of them happens underneath the floor and you get a tsunami. Remember the Asian tsunami? Happy Merry Christmas. It happened the day after. Just an earthquake, really, but it caused a tsunami. Huge tsunami. Indescribable damage. 9.1 in magnitude. Over 230,000 people died because of it. Massive, massive. And then we read about the Japanese tsunami. That's actually the coastline over there. The water is rushing across. If you haven't watched any of the videos from that, you can still YouTube them. They're absolutely astonishing. The water rose almost instantly. $309 billion in damage and counting. And yet, hardly anybody even thinks about it today because there's so much else going on. Uh, 27,000 plus killed, 350,000 homeless. Not long after that, earthquake in Turkey, 7.2 magnitude. What are some of the other natural disasters? We've had some of those recently, haven't we? 2005, the Atlantic hurricane season had the most named storms in history. Remember how many? 28 named storms in the Atlantic hurricane season. 28. Let me give you a perspective. The season's almost done. We've got a little bit over a month left here in the season. We've only hit 14. So many back-to-back -back storms, so much damage. Katrina was the costliest, still to today, Katrina was the costliest storm ever. Over $75 billion in damage. The economic impact is still hitting. It's well over $250 billion and climbing. Right after that, uh, another one was Hurricane Ike. Then we have forest fires. This is the, one of the most deadly fires here. This is a barn that's pictured right out of LaPorte, Colorado. It's called the High Park Fire. To this day, it was the most dangerous fire that happened in 2012 ever in Colorado history. Massive. And, and the fires, if you've been watching, that have been going on in the Northwest, um, another, another aspect of climate uh, change is the fact that the weather no longer cycles like it used to. It likes to go straight across. So all the rain's been coming across, and it's been dry. We haven't hardly had any snow in Washington, and the northern states haven't hard, had hardly any rain. That nice cyclical pattern kind of straightened right out. So there's a lot more wet south of us than they need and a lot drier up here where we need more water. Okay, so not just physical fires, but now we're talking about society as well. A lot of moral fires. There's a lot of fires going on in the moral decay in our society today. Families are falling apart. In fact, today there's a complacent attitude towards spiritual things and moral living. What does that look like? In the 1940s, they began to track births to unmarried women. I mean, we're talking in the really low percents. And in 2010, look at that. More women are having marry, uh, uh, children out of marriage than ever before, and most marriages are going to fail. 50 to 75% of most marriages will fail. The glue that holds us together, that is God, 
is being removed from everything. Governments, climate, marriages, homes. China introduced their version of the gay marriage. New York passed it 2011. Moral decay. Yay, it makes the front page of a Time magazine. Not sure if you can see the pictures in the background. It's talking about the, one of our previous presidents. If you're going to stand in front of the world as a leader, <laughs> you ought to be a good example, right? And that wasn't one of them. Crime and violence are on the rise. This is the World Health Organization gave a report on violence and health. Here's their summary in 2002. Each year, more than 1.6 million people worldwide lose their lives to violence. Many more are injured and suffer from a range of physical, sexual, and reproductive and mental health problems. Violence is among the leading causes of death for people aged 15 to 44 years worldwide, accounting for about 14% of the deaths among males and 7% of the deaths among females. And here's the thing. We're crazy enough to actually help increase that. When you watch things, when you behold things, it changes you. We not only took God out of schools, but we gave children violent cartoons and violent video games and access to nonstop television. Uh, these figures are a little out of date. Um, I, I, I just haven't updated the slide here. Um, the average child no longer watches three hours a day. It's now four and a half hours a day of television is the average that a child watches television. And by the age of 12, they've seen roughly 22,000 murders on TV. You can't say that that isn't impacting them. This gets even more crazy since this was updated. So I'm, I'm, these percentages have changed. There are increases in violence in, in the media, not just in the world, but in media. 45% more vi violence in media today. Foul language is up 51% and sexual content is up 63%. Most of your video games now that children buy are NC rated. That means they're above rated R. They have explicit content in them. And that's not the graphic gore and violence. I forgot to write down his name. I will get that for you if you, if you want to know his name. He was a professional blogger. And he started noticing a trend with all of these school shootings, these mass shootings. So we actually did a little bit of background checking. Interestingly enough, every one of them have been involved in advanced first-person shooter gaming. First-person shooter, that means they're playing a game where they shoot up and kill people. On top of that, multiple of those individuals actually were into creating special, you can actually um, um, make your own levels in those games. Some of them had actually recreated the buildings and the locations where they were going to go shoot people up and practiced before they went and got and shot, went and shot other people up. They practiced using these games to go do that. So he wrote a blog about it, got fired because the video game companies didn't like his. They, they, they brought a lawsuit. The company had to fire him because they couldn't take the liability. He said, why is nobody connecting this? The violent video games are linked to every mass shooting. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We read in verse 12, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It is, isn't it? Read verse 13 with me. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be. In the midst of a world waxing cold in love, we can't. We got to keep our love warm. We got we to still be different in this world. We cannot go the way of the world. If we stay the course, aside from the world, to be different, and to follow the path that the Lord would set in front of us, we shall be saved. That means we've got to live differently. That means we've got to be different. Verse 14, 
And this gospel of the kingdom, the which gospel? The gospel that there will be those who will live differently at the end of time. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then the end shall come. This gospel is going to go to all the world. It shall go. to. It hasn't yet. It needs to go to all the world. He's waiting for us to stand up and be different. But it's hard to be different, isn't it? I mean, you ever tried to drive the speed limit? Right? We don't like to drive the speed limit. Nobody else likes it when we drive the speed limit either. And they let you know that they don't like it. There's all this hand signal going on and honking and whatever and loud language. And... Because you're holding up their ability to disobey the law. You ever thought about it that way? There's a lot of disobedient people around. The world is changing. And by removing God, it's changing even more rapidly than it ever has before. God is on the move, though. God is not staying still. The gospel is going to go forward. There will be a people at the end of time. Revelation ensures us that. There's a prophecy that there will be a people of God all the way to the very end, and they have a message to take to the world. We're going to actually talk about that. It's going to be one of the nights we talk about. God has a people at the end of time, and they have a special message to go to the world. They will not fail. We've uh, missed one of the signs. Go back to um, chapter 24, verse 4. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and verse 5. And it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Could we, I mean, could we really be deceived? I mean, Wait a minute, wait. he's talking to the disciples. They've been with him three and a half years. How in the world would they be deceived? Well, go to verse 11. Verse 11, he expands on that just a little bit. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. False pro- Christ, false prophets. Ah, uh, We've seen a few of those, haven't we? Verse 24. Expands on it a little bit more. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall so show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Who is the elect? Another way to say elect is chosen, right? Yep. That means that if we have decided to give Christ our life, we are part of the, the elect. That means that if we are regularly attending church, regularly studying in our Bible, we, have a, we, we can be a part of the elect. But here's the thing. That means that the deceptions are going to be so good or bad, however you want to call them, that it's very possible to deceive even those who are faithful. Oh, that, that gets really scary because Pew Research did a research a little bit uh, not too long ago, probably about three years ago, and they actually surveyed Christians. And they asked those Christians how much time they spend in the Word of God. The average Christian spends less than five minutes a day in the Word of God. How do you pass a test if you've never studied for the exam? Scarier part? That same survey? The average pastor spends less than eight minutes a day in the Word of God. How are they supposed to lead someone in something that they don't even have time to spend in? Well, these days, it's uh, not uncommon that, you know, uh, for many pastors, you just download somebody else's PowerPoints and, and you never open the Bible. You got to know your Bible. If you don't know your Bible, then how will you know you're being led astray? How will you know whether or not you're being deceived? That's the reason, one of many reasons, I want you to have your Bibles open. I want you to read it for yourselves because I can't make the decision for you. Wouldn't that be nice? That was kind of like that exercise thing. Wouldn't it be nice if there was vicarious exercise? Hey, listen, anyone want to exercise for me this week? <laughs> okay, it doesn't work that way. Salvation doesn't work that way either. You know, I, I know a good pastor, and he says that uh, we're all going to heaven. So as long as I know a good pastor that's going to tell me that, I'm good. We're all going to heaven. Does that work that way? No. You have to make your own decisions. 
In fact, the litmus test is, we've got to turn there, because this is probably my most favorite text in the whole Bible. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. I like this one, and I quote it so often because it is the litmus test for being a Christian. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Good to hear those pages turning. And it says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is how much? No light in them. This is, this is really important. The law, that is the law of God, and the testimony of his prophets, that would be the whole Bible. If they don't speak according to this word, you know, in the old times, they used to mix your poison and your, and your, and your juice together and makes it more tolerable, but it's still got poison in it. I submit to you that if it's got 1% arsenic and 99% juice, do you still want to drink it? No. If it comes to spiritual doctrine, if they've got one thing wrong, walk away. That's what the, the devil never comes to you with a full cup of poison. He says, that looks just like grape juice. You, you want to have some. It tastes real good. I might have put a drop of something else in it, but it looks real good. I made you some fresh baked cookies with some cow pie in it. But don't worry. The chocolate will overrule that. You'll still want to eat it. No. Hold it all up to the law and to the testimony. 100% comes from the Word of God or we walk. That's, it's one of my favorite verses because that is how we should survive as Christians. It's not about denominations. It's not about, about houses of worship. It's about holding the standard of the Word of God. And if it doesn't shine up to the Word of God, you walk away. Okay, need to get off my horse. Okay, United States. The American Religious Identity Survey. In the United States during the last decade, the number of people who identify themselves as belonging to the New Age movement increased 247%. In fact, the modern occult Wiccan, pagan, and Druid religion is now listed among the 10 largest organized religions in the country. Teens especially are attracted to these occult movements and outnumber older converts by three to one. There is a growing... What, this isn't by chance. We took God away from them in school, so they're going to replace religion. We are religious people. And if we won't let them have God, but they can have every other type of religion they want... They're going to pick up something, and they do. You know, there are more fake news. There's more fake news in religion than there is even in politics, right? That's making a mess. How do you know? I mean, because most of them look good, sound good. I mean, I mean, come on, the poison never comes in plain straight poison, right? I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if we knew exactly what a counterfeit was like? But counterfeits are not easy to recognize. They don't show up with a business card that says, Hi, I'm False Prophet. You can find me at www.imdeceiver.com, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great if it all happened like that? Everyone right there told you exactly what they were like. Hello, I'm a liar. No, it doesn't work that way. You don't know. Until you've tested them. How do you test them? How do you test them? By the word of God, right? So beware if a religious teacher leads you from the Bible. Because that's the litmus test. If they can't pass the test, they're going to lead you from it because they don't want to be tested by it. Right? Urgh. Okay. It's not just about that. Think, though, about the other religious aspects. Um, books, magazines, and movies are now moving into the occult and gaining millions and millions and millions from it. The magic and witchcraft and, and all that kind of stuff, you, you can't hide from it anymore. It's, it's filling everything. And the, the sad part about it is the majority of the people that love it are Christian. Here's one example. Left Behind. It, it's been a while since it came out, but I want you to just think about it for just a moment. 
Left Behind by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, sold 62 million copies. Very popular in, in the bookstores, very popular. Um, it, it, they had a, the, a whole newscast about it. They had radio talk show hosts. This is Newsweek. The new what? Of Revelation. There's an expectation if you're just reading that, do you think that they're biblical? In fact, it says why they're biblical, left behind. Wait a minute, what's that word right there? What is a novel? I hear it. It is a work of fiction. Open up their book. In the very, in the very front, it says this, this book is a complete work of fiction. It is not biblical. They are not prophets. They're not talking about revelation. There is nothing there biblical. It's a fake. But Christians quote it often. Oh, yeah, but in the book left behind, it tells us that this is what's going to happen, and we need to be prepared for this because, because they read it more faithfully than their Bibles. They don't know the difference. They got locked, step, and barrel into this. 62 million copies sold. But nobody checked it against the Bible. And nobody read the introduction, which declared that it was a work of fiction. They didn't deceive anyone. They didn't try. They declared to the world what it was, and yet the world didn't even look at it. The world just read it and thought it was, you know, really important. And they're not prophets. It's not biblical. It's a work of fiction. But the world clamors after it because the world at large doesn't test things according to the Word of God. So you get a lot of hype from that. There's a lot of, you know, uh, emotion ramped up on different topics and people are brought to a frenzy. I talked to you about music, even in, even in a church. There's a tendency to want people to get all excited and forget about the Word of God. I happened to visit a church. They took out, for the youth program, they took out all the chairs and put in laser lights. Oh, the kids don't sit down much anyways. We're going to have some stuff for them to mingle. And I said, well, what's the stage for? Oh, well, that's for the concert. Yeah, yeah. Laser lights and concert. Yeah, I know. That's, that's not a worship service you'll find in heaven. In most revivals today, it's all about emotion and not about the Word of God. Well, if you're really emotional, it'll take you all kinds of places, but probably not where you want to go. These false revivals usually are wrapped around an individual. You may have remembered Heaven's Gate. This is after the Hale Bop Comet. Um, basically, uh, Marshall Applewhite uh, came to this belief that God in spaceships was traveling behind the Hale Bop Comet, and as it passed us, he would magically transport his followers up to another corporeal, uh, ex, ex corporeal existence. So another body, another form, etc. So what they did is they got prepared and they packed their bags and they got new tennis shoes on and they laid down, they drank their Kool-Aid, if you will, and they all died waiting to be, you know, resurrected and, and uh, the only people that came for them was the morgue. Interestingly enough, of this situation, you would think that people that would get caught up in this would be like, Homeless folk that really don't know any better or indigent individuals that really have too much time on their hands or whatever the situation was? No, not at all. Not a one of the people here were homeless. Not a one of them were uh, mentally disabled. I mean, registered. Obviously, they, they had a mental block somewhere. They, they were fooled, right, if you will. Um, many of them were mothers and fathers and, and, and engineers and postal workers and you name it. Just regular people hook, line, and sinkered by some person coming along. You know this one. Yep, Jim Jones. We didn't like the way that he was going in the United States, so we had to move all of his believers over to, what is it, Africa somewhere? And lots of Kool-Aid. And then there was David Koresh. Believed he was the Jesus on earth for the time and that, that he was actually the Jesus that was supposed to live out the negatives. And since the first Jesus came and was perfect, he was supposed to be the second Jesus that would be tempted with all of our sins. And so he was the Jesus that should drink and smoke and commit adultery and pedophile and you name it. I mean, he just, because that was, you know, his mandate from God. And then he started stockpiling weapons and a list of his crimes started getting out and FBI started getting involved because there was all kinds of other 
and, you know, thing, illegal things going on, and so they decided to knock on his door, and he didn't want to get knocked on, and so they blew it up. They blew up their own facility. And they all died because of one man that was charismatically motivated to haul them all along on a trip to Nowhereville. Here's another one. Dr. Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda, called famously Dr. Jesus. May 7, 2007, his followers believe that Miranda's life and his teachings now replace those of Jesus of Nazareth. They believe that Jesus is going to come from the sky, Juan Sanchez said, but this is not the way he's going to come. He's here. Here's the thing. That happened in 2007. Where is he now? I mean, number one, some of you didn't even know that name. But beyond that, I have no clue where he went. Then there was the movie 2012. Well, this wasn't a movie. It was based upon an, what is it, Aztec or Mayan, the Mayan calendar. That was it. But here's the thing. They made a prophecy because the calendar ended in 2012 that it must be the end of the world. They didn't stop to think about the fact that they just didn't finish making the calendar. It's kind of like they forgot to print extra. But the world got all excited about the end of the world, and movies were made, and books were sold, and people were worried about the end of the world coming. The, now, there were a few logical people that knew the Bible and, and knew that that wasn't going to happen. But there was also another individual that was laughing at them, but for a totally different reason. You see, Harold, Harold Camping believed that due to his calculations, the world was actually going to end in 2011. So he was laughing at those predicting the end of the world in 2012. He says, yeah, you're going to miss it. You're not going to be ready because it's going to actually end in 2011. So he was laughing at them. He had billboards. He had motorhomes with these wraps on them going all over the United States. I think 14 or 15 of them. He believed that... uh, you know, the world is going to come to an end. Here's a San Francisco Chronicle wrote about him in 2010. Former civil engineer held camping as one of the leading voices of, do- of the doomsday movement. After doing some number crunching based on b- biblical figures, camping has apparently moved up with a new and improved expiration date for the human race, May 21, 2011. New and improved because he tried it back in 1994 and it didn't work. So since it didn't work back then, he redid his numbers and came out with May 21, 2011. <laughs> And who's chuckling now? After, uh, after that happened, I mean, he sunk millions into this. Millions. He had followers coming left and right, giving up their jobs, cashing in their savings, giving them all kinds of money and everything. The day came and went and nothing happened. And he posted up on his website, I guess I was wrong. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then disappeared. He's dead now. And those people got none of their money back. And he just disappeared. He previously thought that the world was going to end in September 6, 1994, but discovered he'd made a mathematical error. Harold Camping lets out a hearty chuckle when he considers the people who believe the world will end in 2012. And what year is it now? Both 11 and 12 have passed, and guess what? We're still here. There's a lot of people that prophesy out there. A lot of psychics. You ever wonder why none of the psychics are rich? They never win the lottery. They don't have a regular clientele that feeds them millions of dollars because they're so good at what they do that they're professional. There's a reason for that. They really don't know. We read earlier Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, knowledge shall be increased and men shall run to and fro. In the world in which we live today, knowledge is at our uh, fingertips. 90% of all the scientists and technicians that have ever lived are living now today. There's an explosion of knowledge going on, and not just in the world at large, but even in the Bible. There is more knowledge about the Bible, and the Bible is more sure than it's ever been. They found more artifacts and more archaeological digs have verified more things in the Bible. We can be more sure of it today than we've ever been in the past. It's exploding all around us. Let me give you a summary here, going through Matthew 24 so far. Signs are being fulfilled, false Christs and prophets, wars, rumors of wars, cries of peace. There is no peace, though. Famines and pestilences, earthquakes, sexual immorality, homes falling apart, violence filling our lands, 
economic uncertainty. We know that Jesus is coming soon. We do know that. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. This text would have saved a lot of people a lot of problems. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. It says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of, of heaven, but who? My Father only. So when people set a time and a date, what do you tell them? You're nuts. You don't read your Bible. I'll be kind to them. Take them gently to Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, and then show them that no man knoweth the day of the hour. And should they claim to do it, they're going contrary to the word of God. Let them go on their way, but help them to understand that it's not biblical, whatever they've tried to come up with. Go back to verse 32, Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. So how do we know when Jesus will come? It says, but now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass. Go down to verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so also, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. The world went on as if nothing was wrong. They kept going. We should expect that things will look like they will keep going, but if we are watching the signs and listening to the message, we will know that it is soon. Interestingly enough, if you check the story of Noah, by the time the rain fell, the door was already closed. By the time they realized they needed to make a change, it was too late. There was no opening that door again. Noah didn't close it. An angel did. That means when Jesus comes, if we're not ready, it's too late. We've got to decide before he comes so that when he comes, we will know it. Keep your hands in, in Matthew 24. We're going to go over to John 14 briefly. We'll be back, so don't, don't lose Matthew 24. John chapter 14. The Gospel of John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So he's promised to come back. But how would he come back? Again, keep your hand in Matthew 24. We're going to Acts now. The book of Acts, it's right after John. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And then we're going to be back in Matthew next. Acts chapter 1. Butterfingers here. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and it says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, and as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall also come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So the coming of Jesus will be just like he left. Number one, it will be literal. It will be physical. He will, he will be there. And as people saw him go, they will see him come in the clouds. 
The angels tell it. Go back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. And it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So again, the coming of Jesus is going to be visible to the world in clouds and great glory. It's not going to be hidden. We're going to see it. Verse 25. Verse 25. It says, Behold, I've told you before, wherefore, also, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in a secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, can you hide lightning? No. Do you see it? Everyone shall see it. If he says, oh, no, no, he's landing in New York. No, 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 don't, no, don't even go. Yeah, he, he's in Nevada. He's doing a special, you know. No, he's not. No, he's not. Every eye will see him coming in the clouds, and it's not going to be hidden. If they tell you, oh, yeah, turn on Fox News or CNN or whatever, don't, don't. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Um, okay, let's go now to Revelation 1, verse 7, and it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. This is really important. When he comes, you don't have to go somewhere to look and see him. Everyone will see him. God doesn't come to just a special few. Now, that's, that, that, that's not welcomed by everyone. Not everyone wants to see him come, but everyone will see him come. Go with me to Psalm 50, 50 verse 3. Psalm 50, verse 3. We're almost done here. Psalms is roughly in the middle of your Bible, the largest book. Psalms 50, verse 3. Psalms, chapter 50, verse 3, and it says, Our God shall come and shall not keep what? Right. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Okay, is anybody going to miss this? A fire will go before him. It will be very tempestuous around him. This is not going to be a silent event. Nobody's going to be taken by surprise. What do you mean it happened? Did I miss it? No, nobody's going to miss it. He's going to come and not keep silent. All right. So if they tell you that he's in uh, Chicago, are you going to go? Uh, what about Australia, South Africa, Brazil? No, don't worry. That's one you want to miss. The one you don't want to miss is the one where he comes and everyone sees him. All right, reviewing. He's going to come in clouds with power and great glory. Got to have all these criteria. It's going to be visible like lightning. Every eye will see him. What about those with no eyes? Global earthquake. He will not be silent. His feet will not touch the earth. Remember, as he went up, not touching, he comes down, not touching. And there will be the resurrection of the saints. Let me take you to 1 Thessalonians to show you this last one. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. I just put that bulletin uh, up there and then actually realized I missed a text. So you want to see this. Don't just take my word for it. Let's go to the Bible and show it to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians is in the New Testament about midway through. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. And we're going to do sixteen through eighteen.
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what? With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the, to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. A shout, a trumpet call, the dead that have been in the graves waiting now are resurrected, and those who are alive waiting now go up together to meet God in the air. You're not going to miss this event. You will not be able to sleep through this. This event will be a worldwide event and not a secret. When Jesus comes, it will be literally coming, visibly coming, audibly coming, and gloriously coming. Interestingly enough, we tend to only hear what we want to hear. Like children, it's not that we haven't been warned before. It's that generally we don't listen very well. In one sense, we know that the end of the world is coming. We see all the signs around us. But is it changing the way we live? You probably recognize this picture. The picture of the Titanic. Everyone said it would never sink, right? Before they went into that Arctic waters, they were warned about the ice fields that were flowing at a significant rate. And what did they do when they were warned about the ice fields? It, we'll, we'll never sink. We're fine. This ship is indestructible. Unsinkable. <laughs> While it was on ground. I like that. As they came up to a particularly large berg, their moment of indecision, it's possible if they'd hit it straight on, they'd actually been okay. But at the last minute, they worried and they wavered and they, they moved. And that just changed the course enough. And that ice is harder to steal. And it ripped right through the hole. Ah, don't worry. There's multiple chambers. It won't sink. It's meant to, 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 to make sure that this doesn't happen. What they didn't count on is multiple holes. Multiple baffles were breached. And they didn't tell anyone. Oh, it's fine. No, 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 it's not fine. This is gonna, no, it's not going to sink. Yes, it's going to sink. And we know today what happened. It sank, broke apart. 1,500 people lost their lives. And the rest, they didn't think through to the end. Now, the Bible talks about two groups of people at the end of time. That's all there is, just two. Those that are waiting for Jesus to come. They look at his coming and they're like, oh, this is our God. We've waited for him. He'll save us. It's time, to, it's time to go home. And then there are the rest that are like, ah, I'm not ready. No. And they run and they call for the rocks and the hills to fall. But it's too late at that time. Just like Noah's time, once the door was shut and the rains came, the decisions were already made. If Jesus were to come right now, would you welcome him with open arms? Or would you have regrets? Or would you wish you had a little bit more time to get it right? It's time we start making things right. Now's the time, before it's too late. If we want to be a part of that family reunion, we want to welcome him when he comes in the clouds, then we've got to be ready now. It's one of those no-brainers. Do you want to choose life? Do you want to choose death? We always want to choose life. But do we practice that? The Savior is waiting to enter you let him come in. 
it's time. It's time we started saying, Lord, we want to go home with you. It's time we made some changes in our life. It's time we started living like we're not living here for eternity, like we're going home with you. When he comes in those clouds, do you want to go with him? It's time we made that decision and made it clear tonight. And that's what I want to ask you. If you're, if you're deciding to go home with him when he comes in the clouds of glory, when he comes back, will you open your arms and, and welcome him? If it's your desire to be ready on that day, would you stand with me right now? Wherever you are, whatever the situation, it's time. It's time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your coming is so soon. We see all the signs. They're fulfilling all around us. And yet, Lord, we've not been living like it. We keep going on with life as if it's never going to change. And you're right there waiting for us. Lord, I pray that right now, each one of us would let you into our hearts. Lord, that we might be ready. Lord, there's a lot of changes that need to be, take place, and we're sorry. Forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, Lord, prepare us for your soon return. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.